please welcome to the stage, Michael Reed. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. Good morning. Um, as an astronomer, it's a special pleasure for me to speak at a conference whose theme is a constellation of insights. Uh, my specialty is explaining the astronomical constellation of insights, primarily to people who don't think of themselves as scientists. And what I want to try and do this morning is convince you of two things. First, that our conventional way of dividing people into those who can do science and those who can't do science is, first of all, wrong, and second of all, harmful, okay? So I'm gonna start off with the harm by begin telling you a little bit about uh, the perspective that I think that science offers that is valuable to people. And I wanna do that by directing your attention to this image here. This is a still image from the National Film Board of Canada movie Universe, which was released in 1960. And what I want you to take away from this picture is how hazy it is. That's not because I took a standard definition video or something like that, it's intrinsically that hazy. And the reason is that in 1960, we didn't have pictures of Earth as it would look from space. The only way people had of imagining their place in the cosmos was, you know, you would sail around the world or fly around the world and kind of sketch out maps, and then special effects people would turn it into that. Okay? But if you fast forward a few decades, only about 15 years after that movie was released, uh, into the 70s, you get images like this for the first time. And you guys are all used to being able to call up an image of the Earth on your phone. In fact, you can call up a 3D model of the Earth on your phone and fly around it if you want. But that was really new. This was a new thing given to humanity by science and technology. So this picture that you're seeing here was taken in 1972 by the last Apollo astronauts that ever went to the moon. And it's an iconic image that is maybe one of the most reproduced images in all of photography. It actually has a name, it's called Blue Marble, and it's credited with changing the way people think about themselves, about the Earth, about the environment. This image was the first one that allowed people to see themselves and their whole planet from outside. It was the first image that allowed people to you know, not think of themselves as individuals, or as neighborhoods, or even as nations, but as one undivided planet. It's also an image that was credited with sparking the environmentalist revolution in the public consciousness. Because for the first time, it gave people the ability to see the Earth as a whole. In astronomy, our job is to turn the camera around. To look away from the Earth and give people a more cosmic perspective. So the image that you're looking at on the screen right now is a very special image. It's maybe one of the most important scientific images ever acquired, and it's called the Hubble Extremely Deep Field. What I want to emphasize to you about this image is, first of all, that although there's a lot of stuff in it, it actually covers just a tiny part of the sky, sort of less than your pinky fingernail held out at arm's length, smaller than the full moon. And almost every point of light that you see in this image is not a star, but a galaxy. Each of those galaxies, and there are thousands of them in this image, each of those galaxies contains hundreds of billions of stars. Each of those stars could be orbited by planets. So for me, as an astronomer, it's pretty much impossible to look at this image and not wonder who might be staring back at us from one of those galaxies. Uh, this perspective, I would say, is a transformative perspective to have. This perspective you only get through science. The ability to think of ourselves in a different way, not to think about our own immediate environment and our own immediate concerns, but to think of ourselves as one species confined to a tiny little rocky planet, and even then, just that the life on our planet is a thin little skin on the surface of that planet but that there may be uncountable billions, trillions of planets out there that support life. So I would claim that this perspective is transformative. It, it transforms the way you think about yourself and about your relationship to the universe. But even more transformative than just knowing these things is knowing that you are a person who is able to discover these things. When you become, like me, an astronomer, and you realize that not only can you appreciate an image like the one I just showed you, 
But you can acquire one on your own. You could go out and actually make that image and discover things yourself. That really changes the way you think about the world. And that's true for all of science. Every part of science has these transformative perspectives. Because I think these perspectives are so valuable, that's why I'm a little bit sad that we conventionally accept that many, many people, the majority of people in society, are unable to participate in this whole sphere of inquiry that we call science. Let's talk a little bit about literacy. The Canadian basic literacy rate, the ability to read and write, is 99%. 99% of Canadians can function just fine in their day-to-day -day life reading and writing. And in fact, that's true of most developed countries. In most developed countries, it would be considered a crisis if the literacy rate was much below 99%. Most developed countries in the world have a literacy rate in the high 90s. Well, what I want you to imagine is how different a world would it be if that literacy rate was 42%. 42%. If 58% of Canadians were unable to function by reading and writing in their everyday lives. Well, sadly, that's exactly the situation we face with science literacy. Only 42% of Canadians have a basic level of scientific literacy. And lest you think that you know, that's a, a particularly shameful thing about Canada, surprisingly enough, that actually places us first on a list of 11 highly developed countries, including the United States, the UK, Japan, and Germany. Those countries each have lower, sometimes considerably lower, scientific literacy rates than we do. And if you think about what this means, it means that 58% of Canadians, more than half, struggle with really basic scientific concepts, such as, does the Earth orbit the sun, or the other way around? Do vaccines cause autism? Is climate change a real thing, and is it man-made? Most Canadians struggle with those kinds of basic scientific concepts, and you can already see in the news media the kinds of consequences that has for us as a society when most people struggle to understand basic science or are even very skeptical of basic science. Uh, as an astronomy professor who teaches a really big course here at U of T, entirely to non-scientific students, people who are not in science majors, uh, I often hear this term, science for dummies. Often my students will ask me, you know, is there a for dummy version of this thing you're trying to explain to me? And the thing that always occurs to me when somebody asks about science for dummies is, who told these people that they were dummies, right? It's a bit weird to be asked to be taught science for dummies because it implies something about you that I don't think is true. The other reason that I think this is especially weird is that you never hear the equivalent phrases for other disciplines. You do hear people say, I'm a bit of a math dummy or I'm a bit of a science dummy. But I have never once heard someone say, can you give me English for dummies? Or can you give me Italian for dummies? Or can you give me political science for dummies? I've never heard that. People approach those, dif those disciplines with confidence. They figure, yeah, I can, I can do English. I could, if I really put my mind to it, I could do Italian, sure. But science and math, not so much. People are very, very afraid of those disciplines. So why is that? Well. One reason, I think, uh, goes back to how we teach. And I love this quote from uh, the lovely, lovely book you should all read called Education as a Subversive Activity. And it's a, quite an old book now, but it's a very relevant uh, quote even still today. And the thesis of the authors of this book was that the way we teach is wrong. And it's especially wrong for science. In science, we teach the discipline as though it consists of mainly memorizing somebody else's answers to somebody else's questions. This is not at all how we teach basic literacy. We don't tell students the most important thing for you is to memorize Shakespeare. We tell students that the most important thing is for you to learn to read so that you can read anything and you can approach reading with confidence. But when it comes to science, we tell them the main thing is for you to memorize a lot of information and then regurgitate it. And this is certainly reflected in all of my conversations with my students. It isn't at all uncommon for my students to say to me, so am I supposed to remember all of the dates that Galileo discovered, the moons of Jupiter, and things like that? That's what they've been given the impression, uh, is learning science. And my job is always to say to those students, you know, no, that isn't what I care about. Who cares when Galileo discovered the moons of Jupiter? These days you can Google that. 
However, would you like to come to this telescope and have a look through it and tell me what you see? So that's what I do with my students. I ask them to actually try and do science rather than just regurgitating other people's science. And when you do this, the results can be spectacular. So these images that you're seeing on the screen here are of a galaxy called Triangula. It's one of the nearest galaxies to our own Milky Way. It contains a few tens of billions of stars. And the image on the right is an image taken by professional astronomers, people you would ordinarily recognize as scientists, people who would definitely describe themselves as good at science. But the image on the left is an image taken by a first-year art student here at U of T, Sharon Lin. And you can see it compares very favorably to the one taken by professional astronomers. What I want you to take away from this is not that Sharon was able to duplicate a result already produced by professional scientists. What you should take away from this, and what Sharon should take away from this, is that having been able to take a measurement like this herself, she will know from now on, whenever she sees a picture like this in the media, how it was made. And she will see herself as somebody who could have had. When she sees an image like the Hubble Extremely Deep Field, she won't just say, that's something that a bunch of scientists made. She will say, you know, yeah, with the right equipment, I, I could do that. I could come to that knowledge of how I relate to the cosmos. I could go all, on all day and show you all sorts of examples. Here's just one more, again, from another student of mine. On one side, we have the image taken by professional astronomers of a lovely cloud of gas and dust in space called the Rosette Nebula. And on the other side, an image taken by my own student, Pearl Cadwall, a first-year English student. English students are usually the first students to say, I'm bad at science, I can't do science. But she can. And she knows that now. And that's what I think is important about this. So the thing about uh, getting students to do science in this way, about encouraging them to think of themselves as scientists, is that it's good for the public understanding of science. It's good for those people. But it's also good for science for people to think this way. And let me give you just a couple of quick examples. Here are a set of images of the planet Mars. And these are pictures taken by uh, a group of people who we used to call amateur astronomers. Astronomy has a very long tradition of average people with telescopes in their backyard doing interesting things. But we don't call them amateur astronomers anymore because that uh, doesn't really capture what they do. We call them citizen scientists. Average people who, just as any one of you might choose to write a novel, you wouldn't necessarily be intimidated by doing that, these people choose to study Mars. They don't have PhDs, they don't work at universities, they're not paid, they do this because they love it. And in this image here, what you're seeing is uh, pictures of Mars taken by some citizen scientists, and in the upper corner there, in the circle, there's a very faint plume of gas, a mysterious plume of gas that we still don't understand, which is lifting off the surface of Mars. No one knows why yet. But what's cool about this is, if not for these citizen scientists, we would never have known about this. There aren't nearly enough astronomers in the world for us to pay attention to everything that's in the cosmos every night. But there are enough citizen scientists to do that. And that's actually how we make a lot of our really cool discoveries. Here's one more. This is a picture of a galaxy. And uh, there's a funny green blob in the foreground. This picture was seen by a Dutch school teacher, Hanny van Arkel. She was 24 years old. She was on a citizen science website called Galaxy Zoo, which asks just members of the public to deputize themselves as scientists. and go through pictures of galaxies and find things that are unusual. But the program is set up to find specific things that are unusual, specific things that astronomers predict might be there. The green blob was not one of those things. The green blob was not something that the program knew how to understand, and it wasn't something that it knew how to direct Connie to understand. But nevertheless, she, she recognized that this was unusual, that this was sort of a weird thing. And she pointed it back out to the astronomers who run the project. And it actually turns out to be something that uh, people hadn't known much about before. It's something called a quasar ionization front. It's a sort of an echo of light emitted by this galaxy uh, millions of years ago. So this is another case, and there are dozens and dozens of these cases of things we would never have known about if the people who made these discoveries had seen themselves, had bought into this message that there are those who are good at science 
and those who are not good at science. So that's the idea I'd like to leave you with today, that we should do away with this notion that there are people who are good at science, people who can do science, and there are people who can. We don't accept that when it comes to basic scientific literacy. We don't say, you know, little Susie is having a little bit of trouble with Dr. Zeus. Well, I guess Susie is just not good at reading. We say, we're going to give her whatever support she needs to become good at this essential skill. And that's the approach I would love to see us take to science. You know, I think we live in a world where it behooves us to have a scientifically literate populace. And to me, a great step toward that is making sure that everybody knows that they can do science. Thank you very much.